Barnabas was in the fellowship of believers. He was a believer. And so Peter asked Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So that's a prime example of somebody who's in the fellowship, who is a believer, who's, who is in the group, but yet Satan has filled their heart. And uh, even Luke reports in the Last Supper, Satan entered Judas, um, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. You know, Judas was a disciple until the very end, and we want to cast doubts and aspersions on Judas, but he was selected by Jesus. He was with Jesus for, we can uh, surmise, three years or two years, however long he was with Jesus, but he was with Jesus every day. So we think, how in the world can somebody that is with Jesus be filled with, with, be filled with Satan? Right there it is. It happens. Um, a demon can push the, push the host person repeatedly into sin. Um, when there is a demon involved, it dulls the perception of the person. Um, you, you know, if we have been involved with people in our lives that, you know, sometimes have you ever talked to somebody and talked to them and talked to them until you think, why can they not get this? Why are they not understanding it? It's because uh, when there is a demon involved, the perception is, is very, very dull. And, um, and, I, and I'm going to throw out a little um, thing here about the deaf and dumb spirit. And, um, and because the Lord ta recently taught me a lot of discernment about the deaf and dumb spirit. And um, the father came to Jesus and said, the, the father of this boy who had epilepsy threw him in the fire threw him in the water tried to kill him and he said he came to Jesus and he said he has a mute spirit and anyway so he said your disciples couldn't cast it out and then um, so the disciples came to Jesus later and said why could we not quote cast it out and Jesus said this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting and so um, sometimes um when somebody is in bondage, especially to that deaf and dumb spirit, they do not have discernment. If someone is under deception, they have no recognition they are under deception. You know, that's the very meaning and definition of deception. Deception means that you, don't, you can't discern the truth from a lie. So if there is deception operating, the person cannot know that. And that's why we can talk to people and talk to them and talk to them, and they don't get it. And that's why... Um, this deaf and dumb spirit, I, I feel like it's one of the most critical spirits um, that needs to be overcome before people can fully walk in, in freedom and peace. And um, I did a, a teaching on that, and it's on, it's on my website, whereheleadsme.org, and it's called Overcoming the Deaf and Dumb Spirit. And some were there when I did it, and it was, um, it's about an hour, nine minutes long. It's a little bit long. But it is, um, the Lord really uh, gave some great insight into that, uh, that passage about this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And it lets us know that when we engage in prayer and fasting, that word comes out means escapes. This kind escapes by nothing but prayer and fasting. So when we have people that we're trying to minister to and they cannot seem to get it, it just seems like you're talking to a brick wall. It's time to go into prayer and fasting and create such an inhospitable position that that demon will not want to stay in that host person um, anymore. And so sometimes you have to come past that deaf and dumb spirit first. And once you get past that, then people can hear. They can hear the word of the Lord. And then they can, um, you know, they can begin to participate in their own deliverance. But if somebody is in complete deception, it's very, very difficult for them to participate in their own deliverance. Can you do that from a distance? Yes, uh -huh. yes. And we'll, and we'll talk, well, let me just tell you why. She had, the question was, can, can you do that from a distance? And, and, the, and the issue is that with the Syrophoenician woman who came with a demon-possessed daughter and the centurion, we talked about them, they are people of great faith. And in those passages, they talk about the ones that they want to see delivered, but they're not there. They're ne those people are not part of that passage. They're just discussed. And so that, that woman came appealing for her daughter, and the daughter, she went home and found her daughter healed. Now, how many times do we see that in Scripture? Somebody's petitioning Jesus. They go home and find the person was healed at that very hour. So 
you know, um, there, I think there is a misinterpretation that people have to be present and, and participate in their deliverance. And by and large, I mean, that is far, far better. If somebody wants it and they're participating, it goes much quicker and it goes much easier. But it, that doesn't mean that people who will not participate will not walk in freedom if, um, with people who continue to intercede and pray. And uh, Jim uh, Cimbala, Cimbala, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. But anyway, he was at the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York, and his daughter um, just became a complete prodigal, actually living on the streets as a homeless person, uh, completely drug addicted. And so um, in his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, he tells of three instances of deliverance. One was one person who prayed for years, and the person finally got healed and delivered. The next one was of a group of people who prayed for a group, like a group of wives got together to pray for their husbands or whatever. And so because there was a group, it was a few months and they were all healed and delivered and saved. But then he was in a prayer meeting on a Tuesday night and uh, this man came up and he never wanted to promote his own personal needs, but this man came up and said, I feel like we're to cry out for your daughter. And so there were 2,000 people crying, and he said it became like a, liber a delivery room, a, a labor and birth room. He said people wailing and crying and, and just pouring their hearts out to God on behalf of this girl. And uh, 38, 36 hours later, uh, he's at home in the shower, and there's a knock on the door, and his wife goes and gets him out of the shower and says, you need to come here. And, and his daughter had come to the door and said, Dad, who, who was praying for me Tuesday night? And so there is this thing that when we gather together, the more that we have praying and interceding, it just, it, it, there's just a bigger battering ram uh, to break through those areas of spiritual darkness. <clears throat> um, so uh, let's talk about uh, deliverance in, in different places around the world and deliverance in North America. You know, we talked the other night about that we're very naturalistic. Um, our society is, if you see it, you can believe it. Otherwise, if you don't see it, you don't believe it. We, we, we're kind of like, a, which state is it that's a show me state, Missouri? You know, we kind of have to like, you have to show me uh, to, for me to believe it. But when we go to Africa and India and other places around the world, those cultures are so steeped in spirituality, even though most times it's negative spirituality, when, when they, they don't have any trouble believing in demonic spirits, they don't have any trouble believing that there is an enemy at work in their lives. So when you talk to them about overcoming that enemy, they, they just embrace that. Um, there, like, like we said, there are many believers who do not even believe in demons. Um, I mean, I, I've heard people say that. I just thought, well, I believe in angels. Well, how can you believe in angels and not believe in demons? You know, how can you believe in heaven and not believe in hell? And um, so anyway, um, but what happens is when we don't recognize what is going on in the lives of people, then people, they don't get free, they don't get delivered. You know, there is, there has been, and I think the church generally is coming out of it, but there has been powerlessness in the church. And I grew up in church going every day, and I never knew or understood what, who the Holy Spirit was until I was way up into adulthood. And I mean, I would open the Bible, and I, and I was one of those people who was deceived. I didn't, I didn't have good understanding. I would read the Bible, and I couldn't get it. But then I went on an Emmaus walk, and I came home on Monday morning and opened my Bible up, and it was like, I get that. I understand. I mean, I started reading about the Holy Spirit, and it was like I understood for the first time in my life there had been a veil that had been taken away from my life. You know, um, deliverance was central to the ministry of Jesus, and... Um, Many times he cast out demons. He told his disciples, cast out demons. In Mark 8, or 10, 7 and 8, he said, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And so we ask ourselves, why do we bother to intercede for other people who are still in bondage? Because freely we have received, freely give. The Lord always leaves, leaves a remnant. He always leaves people, and he has chosen to use us as his instruments of healing and deliverance. And so if we don't do it, remember that scripture I told you the other night, 1 Peter 4.10? Um, 
uh, use the gifts that you have been given as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That's how we show love to other people. Um, okay, here, how many of you have ever actually been in an active deliverance session? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> well, there's some things to watch for. And, um, you know, this, this book on page 116, it gives occasions for uh, ministering deliverance, uh, crusade settings, worship settings, and private settings, um, and ministering with the sick. And, and we've done all of those, um, and, in, and it's different in each, in each case. And, uh, you know, and, I, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this, how many of you have ever seen that you recognized the manifestation of a demonic spirit? Okay, uh, well, there's, I, I, I would also venture to say that the ones who did not raise their hand, you've probably seen it, but maybe you did not recognize it. So I want to tell you some things to look for um, when, when there is a, a, a demon manifesting. Sometimes the eyes will just kind of like roll around and somebody can't maintain eye contact. It might be as simple as that. Um, we talked the other night about keeping your eyes open during prayer. I've seen somebody's tongue slither out like a snake. And, you know, and sometimes people hiss or they'll make other sounds. Um, sometimes I've, I've seen people in prayer when we're praying and they'll close their eyes and kind of shake and they'll open their eyes and you, you recognize that there's something different looking at you from behind their eyes. One day I was in Walmart and uh, this woman um, stopped me and I knew that she had been engaged in an alternative religion. And, um, and so we started talking and I saw pure, unadulterated hatred behind her eyes, and I had been her friend for years, and I knew it was not her looking at me. And but I, I mean, I just saw this thing looking at me from behind her eyes, and I, you know what I did? I just started talking about the blood of Jesus. I just love the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is so precious, and and I just, you know, I just started talking about the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Um, so sometimes it, it it requires some discernment because there wasn't anything different about her but it was the discernment of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> that allowed me to see and know that there was something different um, looking uh, at me. Um, I w Troy and I were engaged in a deliverance, a private deliverance session one time with this woman at his church, uh, not a member, but, but somebody else. And three times she kind of shook and looked at me and said, and who are you? And this was over the course of about 20 minutes. She kind of shake and look and, and look at me and say, who are you? And I mean, I knew each time I was talking to a different demonic spirit. You know, um, no spirit that is not of God can say Jesus Christ is Lord. And so that's, that's kind of a way. And I've been, I have been in deliverance ministry with people. And the person would say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Not too long ago, I was in deliverance with a person. And uh, they took Holy Communion. They allowed us to anoint with oil and pray. And the person said, Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and it was like this back and forth between the person and the spirit. And so when the, it's all coming out of the voice of the person, but you have to discern which is which. So the person would say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And then this thing would rise up and it would be real argumentative. And I'd say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I will never say that. And then, you know, then the person would come back and it was like the person was tormented. I don't know why I'm doing I don't understand these things. Boy, there's a demonic spirit operational in your life. We need to deal with it. And then this thing would rise back up, and there's a battle going on for control of the person at that moment. Um, we, we have seen uh, in, um, in places like um, Africa, Brazil, um, I've, and even in Kentucky, uh, seen people uh, fall on the floor and kind of wither around like a snake. Um, and that's 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 a kind of a extreme manifestation, but it does happen. And um, I'll tell you, many times um, when when something like that's happening, um, you know, we have to remember that the person is a victim, and never confuse the fact that that person is not the same thing as that demonic spirit. And that person is in bondage. We want to always respect the person. We want to minister and love the person. And um, and I'm I'm one. I don't I don't speak to demonic spirits. I don't I don't call them. I don't ask them their name. I don't really want to have anything to do with them. 
You know, I want to deal with the Holy Spirit. I want to deal with the person because if you get to the will of the person,